भयावान या Candice, did you start the recording? I did. Okay. I just started I, it. Mm -hmm. I, I, told I just got starting. the message. Continue. <laughs> and the, the masters are coming. We'll give it a few more minutes if that's okay. Sure. There may be people are working on getting back into Zoom that haven't used it for a while. <laughs> I'm still admitting people. Well, the Canterbury Forum coordinators met this last Thursday of last week, and we're really quite happy with what Zoom has done for Canterbury Forum. Um, we've been able to bring in uh, people to our programs from all over the country, and we're going to be able to bring in presenters who are remote also. So it gives us a lot more flexibility and a lot more outreach. We're, we're finding that too. I think we'd like to have a bigger audience. We're used to having 80 to 100 at our regular in-face meetings, but that's gonna be a while before that happens again. The last Canterbury Forum program, our, pan, our panel on historical pandemics, we had about 85 people. Wow. Zoom in. We had 70 unique logins and a lot of those were couples. So. <clears throat> As the, the chair of the coordinating committee, I really appreciate the fact that Zoom means I don't ever have to worry about snow days again. <laughs> Can I ask a question about logging in to Zoom? Uh, Candace or somebody had posted what one button, hit one button, but yet I still had to put in the, the password. Uh, yeah. Why is that? Did, did I do something wrong or? I don't think so. Um, I'll look at the configuration again. So you had to just put that 1999 on there? Yeah. Yes. For the yes. password? Yes. Um, I did no. also. Oh, because I'll take a look at the configuration and see. Um, so, because I thought that I had disabled that. So, and I tested it, but sometimes I'm different because I've been part of the configuration mm -hmm. thing. So when I test things, it's not apples for apples sometimes. Mm -hmm. So my apologies. No so way. at least it's a it's an easy passcode to remember. So you got to go back and write it down because I didn't remember it. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll take a look at that, David. So mm -hmm. sorry, you. So sorry, you guys. It's even right there on somebody's iPad. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. I had to do the whole thing, password, and then the whole nine-digit number or whatever, the number. and password, mm -hmm. and up the whole works. Hmm. Hmm. So I'm glad you had posted on um, on our website and a, another email also. So I was Yeah, that was just for you, Tom. That's right. I need all the help I can get. Also, I'm looking <laughs> at it in the newsletter. <laughs> Make you work harder. For those that know me know that I need all the help I can get. Tom, you're not alone. I needed both also. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we go like, oh, no, not again. Another. <laughs> I had to look on page six of my passwords, figure out which one I used. <laughs> so we're, we're boosting up here. We're getting more and more. So. Oh, there's the old I'll, I'll get a couple 24. more. Minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> Gene Hall is joining us. Yeah. Good. Gene is. I didn't know Gene and Dick Ulfers were bird watchers. Huh. Hi, Gene. She might be muted. She is well behaved. Hi. 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 <laughs> Sun shining? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to wait a couple more minutes, and while we're waiting, I'll just I'll mention I just got off the phone with a friend of mine in Wisconsin, and he says he's his yard is just full of birds right now. He had like, said six robins in his um, water feature and 
trees are full and I said, we'll send them our way because it's been a little spotty. But uh, I um, seen a few warblers that still have like two, three hummingbirds in my backyard right now, been hanging around. And some of you know that uh, we've been looking at chimney swifts this time of year. Mm -hmm. In downtown Waterloo, there's where they hang around, there's a big chimney at Walnut Court across from the Boys and Girls Club in downtown Waterloo, um, about a block away from two scoops ice cream. But <laughs> they close at seven o'clock though. But I had 1,228 chimney swifts I counted the other night uh, going in there. The most by far I've ever seen. Usually we get 100 or 200, but they're coming through. So it's a good time to check an old chimney out. And um, there keep there used to be a separate organization that kept track of that. Now it's all on eBird. So if you do want to do your own sit at a chimney and count the uh, birds that go in, do it. It's, this one I had 1,200 from 7:30 till eight o'clock, and it was let absolutely me, a vortex of let like me a see tornado. If I, let me see if I've got this straight. You sat there and counted over 12. 100 chimney swifts in 30 minutes? I did. I he had my, used to I, 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 I want to stay on your good side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put my spotting scope up and so you could see them fold up and drop in. And I had a clicker counter. And I don't think, I probably missed one or two. <laughs> but I was working that thing as fast as I could go for probably 15 minutes because they just, it was amazing. But be I can only time. speak as I can only speak as an outsider. But if you missed one or two swifts out of more than twelve hundred, I'd say you can be forgiven. That's right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Again, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> you probably wore out that clicker. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that. I didn't buy the most expensive one, <laughs> but it worked. It's better than trying to remember how many I counted. Yeah. I had. So. Well, we'll, we'll get, go ahead and get started. We may have a few people join us. So uh, mm -hmm. welcome or our back, kind of. We're going to still be on Zoom until uh, January at least. And uh, this gives us the opportunity to bring in some speakers from far away. We have one from an uh, excellent speaker from Nebraska, from Nature Conservancy coming up in November. Uh, Larry Reese is next month. He'll be doing... Um, uh, the ecology of the driftless region in Northeast Iowa, timely for the leaves turning in that area. And he's a, a wonderful naturalist from Winnesheek County. And uh, he'll have a, a lot of in, uh, things to say about the wildlife and birds and ecology. So that's for October. And uh, so we'll look forward to those programs coming up. Uh, we want, uh, Francis tells me we have uh, $65 about in our bird feed fund. So it's time to replenish that. Um, we do have it in our budget to uh, put money in when it's needed, but the dollars we take from our normal budget to replenish that takes away from what we can give out for grants and stuff later. So we really appreciate donations specifically for the bird feeding that we do, which will pick up uh, the first part in uh, November, again, we'll start feeding um, at various locations. So we're pretty good on our, on our budget. Um, we've met our budget for the, our expenses for holding our meetings and our general um, expenditures. So we thank you for that. That comes primarily from your dues. And uh, the local dues are due from in January. They're by calendar year, and if you belong to, which are $15 a year, and uh, if you belong to the National Audubon Society, $20 a year, that's, that's kept track by the month that you um, join. So um, you keep track of that on, on your own, or Francis can tell you when that might be due if you're not sure. So we thank you for, uh, again, for Birdathon donations and um, don't hesitate to uh, um, give a bunch and, and give often if you'd like. That's all going to go for our grant projects. Um, they have the uh, Memorial Walk partially completed at Hartman Reserve. 
some of the bricks that people have purchased are are in place and they're starting to work on the um, native vegetation are going to put up and pretty soon I suppose they're going to be putting up that uh, eagle nest for kids to wander and that was a grant project that we um, helped with thanks to your your uh, donations. Um, Memorial folder for Dick Lynch is in place. Oh yes oh good they must have just got that up. And there's a clay shortage they're waiting for clay to make the rest of the bricks. Oh that's the story on that okay. He just learned that tonight at his other Zoom meeting. How can you run out of clay? <laughs> yeah, how yeah, do you run out of clay? <laughs> <laughs> I think you got, you're got you running out of people that dig it out, probably. Um, let's see, field trips are in, in, in place. We've had some successful ones. We had over 53 uh, species at, at uh, our first walk. And last week, we're at vit mitigation area. I think we had like 46 species of birds. So we expect uh, more coming up here in the next um, the next trips. Our next one is tomorrow morning at 8.30 um, at Lower Hartman. And to access that, it's on our website, by the way. Uh, we'll go to a Lookout Park mm -hmm. and then uh, go down the, uh, yeah, look this up for sure, Yeah, and then uh, you'll access Park Drive by Lookout Park in, uh, in Cedar Falls. Take that Park Drive down to the lower parking lot, which is right off the bike trail. And uh, there's a, um, Craig has posted a, um, uh, a GPS coordinates if, if you need that. But you can look up uh, Lookout Park in Cedar, Cedar Falls if you're not sure. 8.30, we'll leave for there for a couple hours. Hope to have a, have a good turnout. So, I, Tom, yeah. Tom, there yeah. is additional parking. If you stay on Park Road and cross the trail, there's additional parking there also. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, the IOU has their um, fall meeting um, down in, in uh, Centerville this weekend, 17th, 18th, and 19th. It's probably not too late to register. Um, so if that's something you're interested, look up Iowa Birds and Birding uh, website and you can get some information hey, Tom. from that. Yes, sir. Tom, yep. the, uh, the registration is still open, but it might be a hard time finding a room. I, I uh, had a really hard time finding a room down there. Okay. There's a lot of construction going on. Construction workers are taking it over. Okay. Maybe that's it. You know, I've been known to sleep in my car. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so clean out, clean out the trunk, you know, whatever. <clears throat> all right. I think that's about all, all I have um, for right now. Is there anything else from the go to the group things you're seeing or uh, comments you need to make or would like to make? We've got a friendly red breasted nuthatch that's been visiting us. You know, I've, you've, uh, you've had one and we've heard some other people have had them here just in the last few days. It's, maybe we'll get another eruption of the red-breasted nut hatches, so. Keep Is there eyes. a remedy for hummingbirds spending all their energy chasing each other? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's their uh, labor of love, I think. I had one uh, chasing a bumblebee around it, you know. <laughs> and each other and anything that comes close. I wouldn't think that chasing a bumblebee would work out well for either one of them. Well, you might get a feel good about it maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> the hummingbird, so. Well, I'm gonna turn, turn it over to uh, uh, Joel Hawk, who will introduce our wonderful speaker for tonight in a timely, great topic. <laughs> Joel. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Professor Bob Dice is a native Californian, the son of a career naval officer. He received his BA in history from the University of Virginia and his master's and PhD from the University of Michigan. Professor Dice's academic training is in the history of ancient Greece and Rome, and history in general has been his consuming intellectual interest since childhood. Throughout his life, he's read widely in the historical literature in a diverse number of areas. 
including early Christianity, colonial and 19th century America and modern Europe. He joined the faculty of UNI in 1992. He now teaches courses in ancient, medieval and modern Western civilization. In 2009, he created an 18 hour lecture series with the great courses titled Ancient Empires Before Alexander. He's an Air Force veteran commissioned out of ROTC at the University of Virginia. He served three and a half years as an air defense fighter controller at radar control sites in Florida, Minnesota, Alaska, and Texas. And apparently during his time in Alaska, he attempted unsuccessfully to intercept and shoot down Santa Claus. Uh, Bob, received, <laughs> Bob received the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences Outstanding Teaching Award in 2019. And then he received the university-wide top teaching award in 2020 for excellence in teaching. Bob is, in fact, known to a number of us in Praz as a true Renaissance man. You may know him through his involvement with the Canterbury Forum, for which he's both founder and coordinator, or through his teaching as part of Wartburg College's Keep On Learning series. I'm looking forward to his presentation tonight. It's not nice to mess with Mother Nature. Weather, climate, and global warming. Does that pass the baton on to me, Joel? You're yes. on, Bob. Well, I am grateful for the opportunity to present a talk to the Audubon Society when uh, uh, Joel and Linda asked me to uh, approach me to, um, to give a talk. Uh, they asked me to reprise the talk that they'd heard me give in the Keep On Learning course last spring at Wartburg on weather, climate, and global warming. So I've titled it, as Joel said, It's Not Nice to Mess with Mother Nature, recalling the tagline from a 1960s uh, television commercial, I think, for margarine. Uh, but it's appropriate. So I'll share my screen here. And let's see, where are we? There we are. Come on. And get things going. Technology, you know, makes our lives simpler. That's it. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start by defining terms. This is a, a technique I learned when I was a debater in high school. And the two terms I'm going to define are, uh, are weather and climate. So the um, the basic difference between weather and climate is a matter of expectations versus reality. So climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Uh, to, to, to narrow it down a little more, climate is macro. So climate is, is long-term large-scale patterns in temperature, precipitation, wind, and cloud cover. That means decades in length and regional and global in scale. Whereas weather fundamentally is micro, so it's atmospheric phenomena that are localized in space and time. That is to say localities or regions and days, weeks, or months. So there's a, a fuzzy border area in there, but fundamentally this is the distinction between, between weather and climate. So <clears throat> the, um, for thousands of years, prior to the advent of modern science, it was the sacred ancestral traditions, as I call them, that shaped our understanding of nature. And according to the sacred ancestral traditions, weather phenomena were supernatural in origin. That, that is to say that, that weather is caused um, as a result of the intentional actions of supernatural entities, typically labeled by us gods and goddesses. And to, to pre-modern minds, this reasoning was beyond reproach, since no human ruler by himself or herself, no matter how great, is able to summon up storms, floods, droughts, etc. The powers behind weather phenomena, therefore, must be superhuman. So the deity's motives that gave rise to these weather phenomena typically were thought to reflect tensions or conflicts among the gods, or simple emotional peak and mood shifts on their part, or the deities may be responding to actions on our part. And uh, so the idea, of course, then in response to this was that in order to prevent bad weather, all you had to do is give them goodies. So you, you give them sacrificial gifts in accord with the correct rituals. 
and that would keep them happy. And stories, of course, developed explaining the deity's moods and actions, and those come down to us today as myths. But it turned out that everything people had always known was wrong. So it, it, from the 18th century on, the suspicion grew that, um, that nature had its own reasons for weather and climate patterns, that it wasn't some god who creates the weather, and which god anyway, there were so many, so how do you know which one and how do you prove it? And even in antiquity, serious-minded and reasonable people who are always rare, as we know in our own times, had long suggested that maybe nature has reasons of its own for climate and weather. So what it needed was a weakening of the death grip that embedded old time superstition had on freedom of thought among people. And um, so it turned out that supernatural agents aren't needed to account for climate patterns and weather phenomena. All that you really need is atmospheric physics and the basic dynamics of atmospheric physics were worked out uh, from the early 20th century on. So what then are the causes of, uh, of climate? Well, first of all, the most basic cause of climate is that the earth is round, or for all intents and purposes, the earth is round. The second basic cause is that the solar energy is unequally distributed across the surface of the earth because it's a real problem to illuminate a sphere. Um, so the light tends to be concentrated in the middle of the sphere and to be more and more spread out as you move toward either of the sphere's poles. So energy from the sun, therefore, is more intense per square meter near the equator than it is at the poles due to the Earth's surface being curved. Third reason is that the Earth's axis of rotation is tilted 23 degrees off the vertical. Why is the Earth's axis of rotation tilted 23 degrees off the vertical? Who knows? Maybe one of the gods have the answer for that. So a fourth reason is the consequences of that axis tilt. It means that the amount of solar energy that a place receives varies from season to season. So any given place on the earth, the amount of energy or sunlight that it receives is gonna vary throughout the year. So the result of this and the axis tilt is that the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere have seasons that are flipped. The more energy you receive, the warmer you are, and the less energy you receive, the colder you are, which means the northern hemisphere gets less energy and is colder between September and March, while the southern hemisphere gets less energy and is colder between March and September. Fifth reason is the relationships between uh, dry land and oceans, especially continental land and oceans, because oceans and continents differ significantly in their thermal properties. Land does not retain heat very well, so continents tend to be colder and have drier air. Water does retain heat or cold, so oceans tend to be more thermally stable and generally warmer than continents and have moisture air. Furthermore, the surface area of the planet um, is malapportioned between land and ocean. So the oceans cover about three quarters of the Earth's surface area and continental land masses cover about a, one quarter of the Earth's surface area. The continents are concentrated in the Northern hemisphere thanks to plate tectonics, which is another lecture entirely. And especially they're concentrated toward the poles in the Northern hemisphere. So this means that the Northern Hemisphere is cooler because the Northern Hemisphere has the vast majority of the Earth's continental landmass. The Southern Hemisphere, on the other hand, is dominated by open ocean and therefore other than Antarctica is warmer than the Northern Hemisphere. So seasonal climate characteristics therefore differ between the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. Okay, so those are the basic reasons for climate. Now let, let's look at, at the causes of weather. First and foremost is thermodynamics. Nature notoriously seeks equilibrium. So high energy flows toward low energy. That means that warm air flows from the tropics toward the poles where it mixes along the way with cold polar air masses. Um, then the uh, adding the different thermal properties of oceans and land masses together 
with the maldistribution of cold land masses and warm oceans between the hemispheres, means that the Northern Hemisphere is subject to much greater weather extremes than the Southern Hemisphere because air gets very cold and dry over the vast land masses of Northern North America and Eurasia, and then interacts with warm, moist air coming from the Pacific and the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. The result of this mixing is that you get more storms and more violent storms in North America and East Asia, and you get wild extremes of temperature and season like here in Iowa, which as nearly as I can tell has the greatest extremes that you're apt to find anywhere in an inhabited part of the Earth's surface. So then, <clears throat> the um, causes of storms lie in atmospheric physics. So the thermodynamics, the mixing of warm, higher energy air with cold, lower energy air. And the rotation of the Earth on its axis keeps these air masses in motion, producing swirls of uneven pressure, lower versus higher pressure, along the boundaries between the warmer tropical air masses and the colder polar air masses. We call those swirls storms. There's also vertical mixing. Uh, precipitation, meaning of course rain or snow, occurs because higher energy, meaning warm air, can hold more moisture than lower energy or cold air. Warmer air rises into colder air thanks to thermodynamics and cools as it rises in the process, shedding its moisture as precipitation. The moisture inside the columns of air usually is frozen as hail, and then melts as it falls toward the ground. If the hailstones are large enough or the downdrafts are violent enough, the hail remains frozen and falls as hailstones, as we all know. The static electricity that's generated by the rising and falling hail and raindrops is discharged as lightning. So there are the causes of climate on the one hand and weather on the other. So. Now let's look at global warming. Okay, the, uh, I'll start with a consideration of the greenhouse effect. The Earth's surface is warmed, of course, by the sun, the place we get all of our energy from, and then radiates the heat into the atmosphere. Some of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is just one of many greenhouse gases. And then that energy is radiated into space, as you see there with arrow A on the left. Some of the heat makes its way to space directly, as you see with arrow B. Some of the heat is absorbed by greenhouse gases and then radiated back toward the Earth's surface. That's arrow C. With more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, as this century goes on, more heat will be trapped and the planet will be warmed even more. So then, what then are the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? The most notorious of all the greenhouse gases is, of course, carbon dioxide. So we have been able to uh, map or chart the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by taking ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. And we've got to do this fast because they're rapidly melting. But the ice cores that we've taken, you see the data that we extracted from them on this graph. So carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have risen dramatically since the middle of the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution began in Europe around 1800, and it gained momentum during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, concentrated largely in Europe and North America. It has accelerated even more rapidly as the Industrial Rev Revolution spread to East and South Asia and South America after World War II. And you can see how dramatically the parts per million of carbon dioxide by volume have risen, um, well, since the early 20th century and particularly since the mid 20th century. So we can uh, measure carbon dioxide cycles over the last 650,000 years because that's how far back the, uh, the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica extend. So measured by the ice cores, rises and falls in carbon dioxide levels have been normal and regular over most of the last 650,000 years and varied between about 180 and about 275 parts per million. But 
In the last century and a half, they've skyrocketed, as the, gra as the graph shows, to uh, 400 parts per million and now even more. There are many other greenhouse gases besides carbon dioxide that also trap heat. Two of the most prominent of the other greenhouse gases are methane and nitrous oxide. And you can see that over the last 2000 years, the concentrations of methane and carbon dioxide have risen in parallel with the concentrations of carbon dioxide. So all the greenhouse gases have gone up significantly over the course of the Industrial Revolution. Now, critics of global warming have fired back, claiming that the solar cycle, the cycle of uh, sunspots on the surface of the sun, uh, is the fundamental cause of the cycles that we find in, in, uh, in the planet's climate and the rising uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases. Um, the solar cycle means that when the number of electromagnetic storms on the sun's surface, we call them sunspots, increases, so does the amount of energy that the sun radiates. So the solar cycle is the regular rise and fall in the number of sunspots. And as you can see from the graphs, it's typically around uh, an 11 year cycle. Why? I have no idea. The global warming deniers argue that it's the solar cycle that lies behind what climatologists call global warming. But if that's so, then the cycle of warning, warming should be accompanied by cooling and follow an 11 year cycle also but it doesn't, so warming therefore is not tied to sunspot activity. So then, is global warming real? Well, there were a group of climate of global warming skeptics at the University of California at Berkeley who formed a, a group called the Berkeley Earth Project. And they claimed that global warming advocates were cherry picking global warming data by using select weather reporting stations. So what the Berkeley Earth Project members did was a thorough survey of all weather reporting stations. And what did they find? Well, you can see on this graph that what they found is that when you look at all the data, you get almost exactly the same results as the global warming advocates had advanced. So in other words, their, their comprehensive survey demonstrated that global warming is real and as responsible scientists, they were persuaded by the data that they found. We have other evidence for global warming also. And uh, one of the most visually compelling is the shrinkage of Arctic sea ice. Uh, satellites now enable us to monitor the extent of the Arctic Ocean ice cap with extreme accuracy. We know that it grows and it shrinks annually, reaching its maximum each year in February and March, and its minimum this time of year in August and September. And the, science, the satellite data has demonstrated that the size of the annual Arctic Ocean ice cap has shrunk dramatically since 1980. What melts the ice cap is warm water that is brought north by the Gulf Stream and makes its way through the Bering Strait. So the warm water comes from two directions, one of them up off the coast of Scandinavia and past Novaya Zemlya and to the northern coast of Siberia. And then the other one makes its way through the Bering Strait. This is, this is something that I've come to follow every year. You can go to a, an excellent site uh, at the University of Maine called Climate Reanalyzer. And there you can get daily weather maps of a whole variety of things, including snow cover and sea ice. And all of this is compiled by, by satellite reconnaissance. And, uh, and I started noticing the buildup of snow cover in Northern Siberia about three weeks ago. And it wasn't much snow cover, it was maybe six inches to a foot and it melted off. But last year, the same thing happened. You have all of that open water in the Arctic Ocean, evaporating moisture into the air above it. That air moves uh, west to east, as air always does in the Northern Hemisphere. The moist air then moves over the cold landmass of Siberia and falls out as snow. Uh, the early snows will melt off, but the later snows don't. And by the end of October, the beginning of November, 
the uh, the snow cap, the snow cover in northern Eurasia runs three to six feet. So it builds up very quickly. So what happens then is that uh, is that that cold air moves around the planet, joins up with cold air from northern Canada because the air masses move west to east and uh, and is pushed down south by warm air over the northern Pacific. And when all of that Siberian and Canadian air is pushed south, guess where it winds up? So let's see if I can make this video run here. Aha. Uh -huh. Can I? No, I can't. So take my word for it. This is a NASA global warming map. They publish these things monthly, but they also publish annual ones. And you can use their menu on their website to, uh, to bring up uh, global warming maps, maps covering spans of years. Uh, this is the uh, uh, 2020 global warming map. The baseline for comparison is the 30 year period that the climatologists measure these things across the span of 30 years. Between 1951 and 1980, it, it's useful to run the animated video that I couldn't get to run with this presentation. It goes all the way back as far as our data extend in the late 19th century. And the data, of course, are very sketchy then, but they become more comprehensive as you move forward. And the animation shows that there's regular fluctuation between warmer and colder than average years, all the way from 1880 when the animation starts down to 1980. And then in 1980, it takes off like a moon rocket. From 1980 on, the trend becomes warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer. And this is the extreme that you find between January and December of 2020. So the planet is really heating up and it's heating up virtually everywhere. So then, why is it still cold in Iowa? See, this is, this is the, the NASA map from February of 2021. You all remember what February of this year was like. So we were freezing here in Iowa. And of course, that leaves us with the impression that global warming really does have to be some sort of, of a myth. But when you look at the global temperature anomaly map uh, from February of this year that, uh, that NASA released, you can see what's actually going on, that there is intense warming everywhere and look particularly at the global temperature anomaly in the Arctic Ocean. So it is so warm there, it's up to seven and a half degrees Celsius warmer than average in the Arctic. But look what happens with all of that warm air that goes from the Arctic Ocean down over the ice cap in Northern Eurasia. You can see that there's an area of intense colder than normal temperatures in Northern Siberia. And that air then spreads from west to east around the planet over to all the uh, snowpack that builds up in Northern Canada. And then it comes down over the top of us. And if you look really carefully in that vast swath of deep blue in Northern and Central North America, you can see that there's one little swath of really deep blue. And guess what's underneath that little swath of really deep blue. So we and Siberia were the only two parts of the planet inhabited by human beings that were significantly colder than average in February of this year. And this is a very common pattern. I monitor these maps monthly throughout the, the winter. It's a very common pattern for Northern and Eastern North America to be colder than the average. So, so yeah, it really is a question of the haves and have nots. Most of the planet are haves when it comes to global warming. But we're special here in Iowa. We're just as special as the people in Siberia. So what is the uh, uh, effect of all of this global warming that's taking place? Well, of course, as the ice caps in Greenland and Antarctica melt, and I'm seeing more headlines all the time about how dramatically the ice caps are melting there, uh, sea level is rising. This, the rise of sea level is incremental. Uh, in general terms, it doesn't have to be dramatic. I mean, it has been more dramatic in the past. The middle of the last uh, continental uh, ice sheet advance, which peaked about 20,000 years ago, 
sea level, according to the US Geological Survey, was about 300 to 400 feet lower than it is right now. And the edge of the, the, the shoreline of North America lay at the edge of the continental shelf, a couple of hundred miles out from the present shoreline. But of course, the problem is that since the dawn of civilization, 10,000 years ago, we have developed nucleated settlements, and a lot of those nucleated settlements got planted along coastlines because it's cheaper to feed large masses of people if you can bring the food in by water than it is if you transport it overland, at least prior to the invention of the railroad. So the big cities of the planet tend to be located along coastlines, or they tend to be located along um, easily accessible navigable waterways. And so as sea level rises, a mere six meters, so about 20 feet compared to the 400 that it rose with the melting of the last ice sheets, all of the area under red there is going to be underwater. So, so long Mar-a-Lago, so long Disney World, it's all going to wind up as, uh, as, as, as fish fantasy lands there. So... This is a map of what the European ice sheet looked like at the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years before the present. You can see that Scandinavia was under a sheet of ice, the North Sea was under a sheet of ice, the Northern and Central British Isles. But you can see that the rest of Europe was pretty much ice free, aside from the areas immediately at the, along the slopes and at the feet of the Alps and the Pyrenees. So, Europe actually didn't suffer all that much from the last uh, glaciation. On the other hand, here's North America. North America is where the, the glacial ice sheets are always the most extensive. The glacial ice sheets are most extensive here in America. Most of the water that evaporates and is frozen and deposited on land masses from the oceans ends up here because of the fact that North America has this peculiar configuration, kind of like a funnel, that grows wider as you move up toward the pole. And of course, that configuration also sharply constricts the uh, access of the warmer waters of the ocean to the northern part of North America. So what winds up happening when you get the buildup of a continental ice sheet is that the snow falls over North America and then it doesn't all melt during the summer. This does not happen in Northern Eurasia for the simple reason that oh, aside from the open waters of the Arctic Ocean, there is no good source of water and moisture to lay down an ice sheet in Siberia. So every year when the Arctic Ocean freezes over, the supply of moisture in the air is cut off and that puts a stop to the buildup of the snowpack there. Not so in North America. So the snowpack builds up and if it gets to the point where the snow doesn't all melt off in the, in the summer, over the course of years, that snowpack builds up and as it builds up, it develops its own local weather patterns and ultimately its own local climate patterns. And that means that you end up with a dense snowpack, the pressure of which turns the snow on the bottom into ice, the ice begins to move and so instead of a snowpack, you have an ice pack. And instead of an ice pack, you have a glacier. And over the course of tens of thousands of years, that glacier pushes on down to the south. And, uh, and I'm not sure how thick the ice was here in Iowa, but I know it, it's thickest up there in Hudson Bay, which is land that was depressed by the weight of the ice. It was a couple of miles thick. So we're talking about a 10,000 foot thick ice pack in northern Canada and an ice pack here in Iowa that was at least two or 3,000 feet thick. So this is an immense uh, deposition of snow and buildup of ice in northern North America. We're the people who will suffer the most from uh, any subsequent uh, ice advance. And the point that we all need to take away from this is, is the fact that we are not out of the ice age. So the best agreement that I can find among uh, geologists and climatologists is that the current ice age began about two and a half million years ago. And it probably began because of plate tectonics. The crust of the planet consists of large plates that are in motion. And it's about two and a half million years ago that North America and South America due to tectonic forces uh, came in contact with one another with the lifting of the Panama Isthmus. 
the lifting of the Isthmus of Panama cut off the circulation of equatorial warm water around the planet and dramatically altered weather patterns. Since the Isthmus of Panama is still there and doesn't look like going anywhere, the ice age is gonna continue. So here's something that we need to think about apropos global warming. We are in a situation right now where we're getting the buildup of snow every winter in Northern Eurasia. The cold air that, that uh, forms over the snowpack in Northern Siberia moves west or moves east thanks to the westerly winds in the Northern hemisphere. It's pushed north over the Arctic by the warm water in the Northern Pacific, comes down over Canada and drops more snow there, building up an ice pack in Northern Canada that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And if it ever doesn't all melt off during the summer, global warming could be the reason why we see the buildup of a new glacial ice pack in Northern Canada. And at some point, 10, 20, 30,000 years on down the road, we see the advance of, of another 2,000 or two mile thick sheet of ice from Northern Canada down to the South. So the links between global warming and, uh, and the formation and advance of continental ice sheets may in fact be very direct and form a cycle that will go on for who knows how many millions of years until finally the continents break up and the, the global climate patterns can return to a more normal and warmer condition. So friends, that is my, my uh, presentation to you on, uh, on weather, climate, and global warming. I'd have, be happy to take any questions that people have. Do bear in mind that I'm trained as a Roman historian and not as a climatologist. So any, any uh, answers that I offer will be those of what I trust is an educated amateur, but in any case, an amateur. Shall I check the chat box myself or does somebody else want to do it? Actually, there is a question in the chat. Um, it's asking, this is from David, what is the timeline for the six meter sea level rise? Uh, I'm not sure what the timeline is for that. I would imagine it's, it's pretty much the next century to century and a half. Um, we, we know that sea levels are beginning to inch up, but I choose the word inch intentionally. Now, the problem is that you don't need many inches in order to start submerging places like the Outer Banks of North Carolina or the Jersey Shore or the coastline there in central and southern Florida. Uh, we've already seen the impact that that slow but an incremental sea level rise has in conjunction with the increased temperatures uh, at the surface in the Western Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico and the intensity of storms and the kinds of storm surges that we're getting as a result of all of that. So it doesn't even from our perspective necessarily have to be uh, a regular rise in sea level of six meters. It can be the fact that even though sea level has only risen say a foot or two, that still represents a lot of inundation to low-lying areas. And it also means that the storm surges will become even more destructive and far-reaching. Does that, does that answer the question? Never ask a history <laughs> professor a question because we, we, we have a hard time talking in units of less than 50 minutes. <laughs> this, this is Tom, I'm, I'm curious about um, particulates that are in the air from either farm chemicals or smoke or other things that go up besides carbon dioxide. Does uh, the uh, global warming impact the, the amount of time that those chemicals and particulates are in the air or if that makes sense? I, well, I mean, again, bear in mind that I'm trained as a historian. So what I'm gonna offer you here is just a, a speculation on my part, but the more energy the, there is in the air, the, the greater ability the air has to keep fine particulates suspended within it. And so, yes, I, I would think that it could have an effect. Fine particulates might remain uh, suspended in, in the air and especially in the upper atmosphere longer than they would have otherwise. But that, that's, does anyone here have, have um, 
an educated and, and professional um, uh, insight to offer on that? So would sparrows count as fine particulates? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or higher, hummingbirds yeah. chasing bumblebees. <laughs> Bob, it's not directly uh, on the same point, but aren't the particulates what uh, uh, ice chunks form around and then eventually become raindrops? So as there is more um, more dust up in the atmosphere, it it allows more condensation or at least something for the condensation to cling to? That, that's, that's my understanding. But, you know, again, I, I, I don't have training in meteorology, but my understanding's typically been that, that yes, um, rain does at least often, if not always, form around particulates in, in the atmosphere. I, I, I know I've watched clouds form as, as warm, moist air rises up the slopes of a mountain. This is why the Greeks thought that, that Mount Olympus was the abode of the gods because it sits on the coast. And so every morning, the, the, the sun warmed air of the Aegean would rise, it would go up the slopes of the mountain as it went, it cooled. And so it formed into clouds and they figured that the gods were building clouds around Olympus in order to have some privacy. But um, I, I don't know that, that, that the formation Formation of clouds probably just involves physics, whereas the formation of, of hailstones and, and rain may involve fine particulates. I mean, it would be an interesting thing to see where all of the, you know, the, the smoke that's blowing off of the, since the West Coast is on fire, does that have any impact on the formation of precipitation patterns uh, in Eastern North America? Heaven knows they've seen a lot of rain in Eastern North America here lately. So. Well, would it be possible to go back to um, volcanic eruptions that spewed a lot of dust into the air to see if that uh, historically produced changes in precipitation? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, I know that we can identify when particular eruptions took place because every volcano has a unique chemical signature. And by taking ice cores and, and sampling the, the volcanic chemicals that are contained in the ice and then meticulously counting the annual layers back, we've been able to do things like precisely date the year when the uh, island of Santorini blew up in the Aegean in the Bronze Age. It was 1628 because we were able to detect that from ice cores, not only in Greenland, but also in Antarctica. So, but I, you know, th th those will be chemicals as well as particulates. So I, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, we could use the analysis of ice layers and the associated deposition of volcanic particulates to say anything definite about the uh, precipitation patterns. I do know that there has been, um, a lot of very in informed research done on the role that massive volcanic eruptions, especially fissure eruptions, that produce these, these immense lava flows in the, in the ocean, as well as in continents like the Deccan traps in India, Siberian traps in Northern Eurasia, the Colombian lava fields in the Pacific Northwest, all erupted from fissure eruptions rather than volcanic cones. And I know that those things uh, have been associated with dramatic climate change in the past. We, we've seen the effect that individual volcanic eruptions have in cooling the climate. Uh, most recently, when Mount Pinatubo blew up in 1990. And before that, there was the, the eruption of Katmai in 1911 and, and Krakatoa in 1883, all were associated with dramatic cooling. My, my understanding is that many of the fine particulates are too high in the atmosphere to uh, cause precipitation. <clears throat> I wonder if those things, because they've got to go somewhere. So they, they must, therefore, I would think, settle down into the lower reaches of the atmosphere where they could form as the focuses for condensation. I, 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 don't, I don't see how in the upper reaches of the atmosphere they would then escape into space. I mean, maybe it's possible with solar energy over time, but, but uh, 
But I would think that eventually they, they, you know, what goes up comes down. Yeah, maybe it's the rate that they come down. But mm. you know, we haven't had much more rain in here because of the fires because it's so high in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. At least that's my understanding. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how up, how high up in the atmosphere the smoke clouds from the fires go. I know the volcanoes can throw their the um, their debris up, you know, 10, 12 miles into the atmosphere if, if their eruptions are violent enough. But these are fires which don't contain as much energy. So I don't know how high up those could get. Let's see. We have a, a question or a comment down here from Candace Havily about what was that? Let me see. Um, book by Elizabeth Rush titled Rising, about the rising sea levels. NPR Science Friday's new book club selection. Hmm. Anybody else? It's kind of a quick yes. rush through this whole issue of, of weather versus climate, and then finally global warming. I don't remember how long the lecture took, and keep on learning, but I know that I wanted to leave time at the end of the lecture for question and answer, so. So this is Candace. Um, so at the end of your presentation, you were talking again how the um, global warming was creating more of an ice pack in Northern Canada. Do you, is that going to bring on a bit of a, another small ice age? Uh, I don't. Uh, we, we have had a number of periods of major cooling um, since the dawn of recorded history 5,000 years ago. The most notorious one is the Little Ice Age that began, I guess, in the, at the end of the Middle Ages and extended down into the, the 18th century. Um, the uh, ice pack currently is not building up in northern Canada. And the snowpack in northern Siberia does melt off every summer. And the snowpack that builds up in northern Canada also melts off every summer. The, the problem will come uh, at, at some point when the, you get enough moisture in the air that the ice pack, that the snowpack does not entirely melt off. And so then uh, if, if you get a deep enough snowpack, it will generate microclimates and ultimately those microclimates will become macro. Uh, I don't see any danger of this happening anytime soon, um, but I, 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 and I would imagine that, that we might be able to develop uh, ways of, of reversing that, that could be very crude, like sprinkling dark objects over the surface of the snowpack that would collect uh, solar energy and contribute to melting or something else. I mean, with a little luck, what we wind up doing, of course, is we control the amount of uh, greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere or even eliminate them almost entirely. Um, but we don't know whether we're at, at some kind of tipping point where it's become irreversible. But right now, the buildup of a snowpack in Canada doesn't seem to be in prospect. Um, but it could be, and, and we don't know when that, that might happen. So I, I, do, I do see a very um, sensible logical link between global warming and increased precipitation in uh, northern Eurasia and in northern North America and the emergence of new continental ice sheets. Given the fact that, given, given the, the, the solid backing for the idea that uh, the uh, emergence of ice ages over the last two and a half million years is due to tectonic rearrangement of the continents and the fact that that tectonic arrangement of the continents is not going anywhere anytime soon. This is going to be a, an ever present threat going forward millions of years. It, it has been worse in the past 600 million years ago, the entire planet was encased in ice evidently. What, uh, what do you see as um, in the Southern hemisphere as far as uh, rising waters about the same or different? Well, sea levels are gonna rise 
pretty much universally. I mean, sea level isn't exactly the same everywhere you go around the planet. But if sea level rises six meters here, then it's going to rise about six meters also, Tierra del Fuego. Um, I have seen some really frightening stuff coming out about what's going on with the, uh, the ice sheets in Antarctica that they're beginning to show signs of falling apart, this is a reminder. which is which is very bad news. I mean, the ice sheets that sit on water in Antarctica are basically already factored into sea level, but it's the ice sheets in the interior of Antarctica that we have to worry about because the ice in there is a couple of miles thick. And if that melts in any serious kind of way, then sea levels really are gonna go up and they're gonna go up in Antarctica as well as elsewhere. But part of our problem is that, of course, the distribution of our population centers reflects a, a historical pattern that it's, I don't see any practical way that you can move New York City 100 miles inland. So I, I don't think they'd like having New York City in Albany. I, I can't say for sure, but. I look at places like uh, Shanghai, or just 20 million people living uh, one meter above sea level. So, you know, it's, and then 60 million people proper. Australia, where 80% of the people live on the coast because it's just too darn hot living in the, on the interior. Yeah, and you, you got to think, think about a place like Bangladesh, you know, where, where so many people live literally in the delta of the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers. And it, you know, it doesn't take much at all to turn all of that into, you know, from, from river delta into marshland and then finally into, and submerge it. What do you do with those people? You know, I mean, the, the climate refugees are a problem that I see discussed more and more frequently by scientists and also by increasingly by policymakers. So, you know, there are things we can do to adjust our own behavior. Well, one of, you know, one of the enduring questions, and this really intrigues me a lot, is the fact that when the ice sheets began melting about 17 or 15,000 years ago, they melted very quickly because temperatures rose over the course of 2,000 years, temperature, temperatures rose 10 degrees Celsius. How? What happened 15,000 years ago that jacked the temperature of this planet 10 degrees Celsius in 2,000 years? I mean, the Industrial Revolution can't pull that off. How, how did temperatures go up so dramatically back then? Um, so, you know, we, we do get these, these, these wild fluctuations in temperature and climatologists, so far as I've been able to detect, are still scratching their heads over how that, how that happened. And of course, we've been through episodes of glacial advance and retreat, the interglacial periods. Usually you'll get 50, 60,000 years of, a, of the advance of an ice sheet, maybe more. And then you'll get 20 or 30,000 years where it melts off and the planet's warmer and you have an interglacial. Uh, climatologists debate how many glacial advances there have been over the last two and a half million years. The smallest number I've seen is four. And then I've seen other people who suggest there were more than a dozen. And the problem is, of course, that each glacial advance tends to erase a lot of the evidence of previous ones. But, uh, but it looks like this is a regular sort of thing in the planet's recent history. And barring our ability to dramatically affect that in a positive way, it's gonna be a regular thing in the planet's future too. Bob? Yeah. This is Dick Olfers. Hi, Dick. I've been reading about the Northwest Passage opening up. Yeah. Run cruise ships through it. Yep. Won't that mess up the ocean currents <laughs> and change change that around? The current, the discussion I've seen about the, the alteration of ocean currents um, is really disturbing. It doesn't address that, but it does instead address the currents that exist not near the surface, but down near the bottom. So the Gulf Stream, of course, is a surface current that runs from the, the Caribbean up, up off of Scandinavia. But there are deeper currents that run in the opposite direction 
um, from the Arctic down through the Atlantic. And I've seen discussion that those things are in danger of breaking down. And if that breaks down, thermal exchange across the entire surface of the planet could be badly disrupted. And I don't know what the climate models say about it, but I'm pretty sure it's nothing good. Thank you. So, so the surface currents are not the issue. It, it appears to be the thing that most disturbs oceanographers is the subsurface uh, currents. Carry cold water usually from the Arctic down toward the equator. And then you get the warm water that flows north closer to the surface from the equator toward the Arctic. Well, Robert? I, yeah. Um, you've gone through the uh, whys and wherefores of what's happening. Have you uh, thought yourself about what we can do and how quickly we should do it? Well, yeah. Um, I think that, well, of course, there's a lot of debate about what to do about climate change. And of course, plenty of you know, people out there who say that there's no such thing. But we, we do have the technology to dramatically slow or even arrest the buildup of greenhouse gases and maybe halt the growth of global warming. So as we, uh, I drive Volkswagens have for decades and Volkswagen, I guess is the largest auto manufacturer on the planet and has said they're not gonna build any more gas powered vehicles after 2030. So that kind of step forward is, is, is very important. Um, so you, the, you, know, the, you can use electric power to run vehicles. There are interesting things you can do with hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, solar cell technology has become much, much more affordable. I see more and more people who are roofing their houses with solar cells. Uh, wind turbines are, uh, I, I think, a uh, really spectacular sight as I drive around Iowa. It, it's sort of the, the 21st century equivalent of the pyramids in, in their scale and magnitude. So all of those things contribute. And Iowa now produces a significant percentage of the energy it consumes from wind and solar. Um, and that trend is advancing rapidly elsewhere. The question is whether it's advancing rapidly enough. So that can help to arrest the buildup of greenhouse gases and it can help to arrest and then halt global warming. But the question is whether we pass the tipping point. And I'm, you know, you, you don't have to look very far usually to find people who are doom prophets, but sometimes the doom prophets are right. So I remember saying when that, that, that the surest sign of the end times would be the Cubs win the World Series. <laughs> they won the World Series in 2016. I meant it as a joke, honest. I meant it as a joke. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the, they just might be right that we're past the tipping point, but still whatever we can do to move away from uh, power sources that 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 add to the to the heating of the planet is is good. Plus, plus we learn more in the process, you know. So, so this is how science advances often is through a, a succession of crises. Uh, I've read that we've crossed one tipping point that the Amazon has gone from a carbon absorber to a carbon emitter, mm -hmm. and that that's a major tipping point. So it's gone from a carbon absorber to a what? Car carbon emitter. Really? The Amazon jungle? Yes. Oh, because they're cutting it down and burning it up. Yes. Yeah. And drying it out. Yeah. I, I don't know what you do about that. You know, I mean, you, you can't control what the Brazilian government, which evidently has a lot of problems of its own. And, and they're converting the what they clear to um, ag land, pasture land. So they've got cattle and of course they produce methane and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, I've, I've read that too, David, and it, it, is, it is frightening. Now it's, it, it, it's a useful thing to look back at past patterns um, since the dawn of agriculture and human civilization, because we're, we're thanks to archeology span developing a more comprehensive and detailed knowledge of that. I recommend two books to people um, 
titled 1491 and 1493. The first one is about what the Americas were like just before Europeans and their diseases arrived here. And the second one is about what the encounter between the old world and the new world uh, did to each of them. So there's plus and minuses to that, but it's really, really dramatic <clears throat> to find out, according to 1491, uh, the nut trees of the Amazon basin turn out to be localized in species. And according to what the book says, um, the easiest explanation for that is that originally they were farmed. And so these were areas where, you know, particular types of nut trees were raised for food. And the archaeologists hunting around on the forest floor there in the rainforest found evidence of fish middens uh, that evidently the people who were raising these groves of, of nut trees a thousand years ago uh, would take advantage of the annual flooding of the Nile River to trap fish. And those fish middens, that's where they got their protein from. So they were kind of farming these nut trees. Sometimes they find pottery that these people had made in the deposits down there. So, and a lot of North America, according to what the archaeologists are claiming, was actually under cultivation back in the 15th century before Europeans arrived here and sneezed on people. So, you know, the world was a different place back then, and this may help to explain some of the changes in climate patterns that we find during the Middle Ages, and especially like the Little Ice Age, immediately afterwards, when all of that agriculture in North and South America was shattered by the arrival of European diseases. I mean, 95% of the population was killed off by those diseases, they had no immunity. And uh, so this catastrophe dramatically altered the, uh, the climate around the whole planet and you know, produced coal, uh, a cooling period. So we've been through a lot of different cycles and archeology span is helping us to understand how human activity contributed to those cycles in the past. <clears throat> Bob, we have a question on chat. Oh, okay. Uh, why is temperature increase more extreme near the poles? Won't this ex exa exacerbate the release of methane gas if the tundra starts to thaw? Oh yeah, it absolutely will. Um, you, we, I think it's important to remember that these are global temperature anomalies that we're talking about. So those NASA maps reflect how much warmer or colder than that 50 year average between 1950 and 1980 uh, is. And so normally it's really, really, really cold at the poles. So if temperatures there go up seven degrees Celsius, it's still really cold at the poles. It just isn't really, really cold at the poles. Um, whereas farther south here, of course, we notice it a lot more. Um, but that does matter. I mean, one of the things that, that is um, worth noting also, and this shows up on the climate reanalyzer maps, the University of Maine, is the sea surface temperature anomalies, how much warmer than normal the surface of the oceans is. There is a huge area of much warmer than average surface water in the Northern Pacific. Uh, people out there call it the blob. Um, we've seen this repeatedly over the last 10 to 20 years. And when the Northern Pacific is so much warmer than average than that, it has a dramatic effect on the high altitude winds that steer weather patterns around the Northern Hemisphere. So this helps to explain why it's been so dry and so hot on the West Coast and in British Columbia. And also helps to explain why it is that the weather has been so violent in the eastern U.S. because they're on the other side of the of the, the airflow that's generated by the blob out there in the northern Pacific. So yeah, it, it does, the, the, the warming in, in the northern hemisphere does enhance permafrost melting and that dramatically enhances the release of methane gas from the, from the, the tundra. Well, it looks like we may have time for maybe one more question or so. 
or so. I, I've got one. I, I've go asked ahead. them already. So if anybody else has one, go ahead. Knock yourself out, Roger. Uh, well, Bob, <laughs> you, you didn't include floor, uh, fluorinated gases with uh, greenhouse gases. And aren't they even more persistent than even methane? Well, I, I can't speak to that, Roger, but, but again, there is a, there's a whole long catalog of greenhouse gases. And what I offered there, th this is uh, not just stuff I prepared for keep on learning. I, I do this in my, uh, my uh, Western Civ class, modern Western Civ class at UNI too. So this is material that I was able to generate online. So when I went around looking for this kind of graphical material on global warming, this was the kind of stuff that I was able to locate. So um, I, you know, based on what I've seen with the nitrous oxide and, and the methane, uh, I would be inclined to think that all of these other gases uh, also are accumulating in the atmosphere at a, at a comparable rate. Well, we have quit using Freon and that was one of them or it contributed to one of them anyway. But. Yeah, I think the hole in the ozone finally closed. I'm not sure whether it's going to reopen or not. I, I'm getting kind of mixed messages on that, on, on what I read. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, so we have scored some successes in our battle against chemical pollution and the uh, deleterious effect that it has on, on climate. But there's, there's so many deleterious effects that we need more than some successes. We need all of them to be successes. And that's just going to take effort and that's going to take political will. And the question is, can we muster that political will? See how hard it is to get people to get vaccinated against a clear and present danger from a, from a pandemic. It's that much harder than to get people to take action against something that isn't immediately apparent to them, like global warming. And every time it snows, somebody is going to say, well, see, there's no such thing as global warming. So I show them that map. Yeah, there isn't in North America this particular month, but look at the rest of the planet, because that's why we call it global warming instead of local. So what goes on everywhere else around the planet does have a profound impact on us here. So, Well, this has been a really interesting program and discussion. And Bob, or thank you for... Uh, for your work with this and my pleasure i'm grateful for the opportunity on the chat there's some uh um candace has put a few things on for some of the books you may want to think about and that's link. it charles mann is the author that's right yep and uh i want to thank francis and candace for their good job of getting us to run efficiently <laughs> and well um so we hope to see you all unless we got another question or so. Well, um, thank I'll you. Put, oh, go ahead. I'll put the links to the climate reanalyzer um, and the NASA climate site on our webpage. So thank you for sharing that information because those will be very interesting to go back and reference. So, yes. so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Definitely. Well, thanks again, everybody, for this opportunity to... Uh, to speak to all. My father was an avid birder all of his life. My sister and her husband are avid birders also. My wife and I are not, but we do keep a list of all of the species that we've seen in our backyard. And the scary thing for me is I'm learning to tell one type of sparrow apart from another. <laughs> I'd say you're a birder, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm a mushroom hunter first and foremost. So. <laughs> Uh, we had Audubon or, or more than just birds. I think we chased everything with wings <laughs> or not, you know. But, or not. Or spores and, as well. I'm right. there with you on the mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hey, Thank you, everybody. Tom? Yes. One of the questions there says, when do I need to pay Prairie Rapids Audubon Society? It must be for dues. Uh, our dues run from January to December for, for local. local. Mm -hmm. And then uh, National Audubon, it's whenever your monthly, your yearly thing comes up. Mine mm -hmm. is in April. If uh, somebody paid now, 
that would count for the rest of this year and all next year. Is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, late enough in the year that we would carry it forward. Mm -hmm. For our local. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Thanks again. Thank you, Thank you very, much. very much. Hi, Hi Mayors. <laughs> Hi guys. Oh, so there's plaques. <laughs>